All right. Hello, senders. Welcome back to another episode of the Segment Podcast and YouTube Live. Um, tonight, my special guest is Dr. Michael Welsh. He is the co-director of the Allergy and Asthma Medical Group and Research Center. Uh, Dr. Welsh is a graduate of UCLA. He is an allergist and immunologist in San Diego. He's affiliated with UCSD and Rady's Children's Hospital. And most recently with the pandemic, Dr. Welsh has holds a chair on the COVID vaccine and allergy committee. And uh, guess what, guys? He also jumps on the mountain bike too. So without further ado, Dr. Welsh, how are you, buddy? Hey, great. Thanks, Mark, for having me tonight. Yeah, thank you for jumping on. And um, I really appreciate it. I, I wanted to reach out to you because um, there's been a lot of chatter about the vaccines, specifically the COVID-19 vaccines. And um, I know there is uh, folks out there that might be confused because there is a ton of data around it. There's misinformation, information, real information and misinformation. So if that'd be you know, perfect timing to have you on to talk about it. As it we is. It is good timing. Yeah, definitely. So, um, Dr. Bosch, take us to, let's talk about that chair of the COVID vaccine allergy committee. I kind of touched upon some of your credentials, um, but how did you get involved with this, uh, COVID vaccine committee? Well, and by the way, group, I have been fully vaccinated. That's why I'm calling myself fully vaccinated. Mike, <laughs> I have, are you Moderna or are you Pfizer? I'm a Moderna guy. And, nice. uh, cause it had less volume and I'm a wimp and I didn't, I didn't want the 0.5. I got the 0.3 ML. So, uh, <laughs> anyways, I I'm still alive. I'm doing great. I had minimal reactions. So anybody fearful of this vaccine, I don't want to tell you that everybody's going to have a piece of cake, uh, with the vaccine. And the second one supposedly is a little harder than the first one, but, but other than a sore arm, I, uh, it hasn't stopped me one bit. So just to, for anybody who has any vaccine, reluctance um mm -hmm. it, in terms of that it's um it's worth it so how yeah. i got involved in, in san diego i'm an allergist in san diego and i got a uh, email from a pediatrician who was worried that they were allergic going to be allergic to the vaccine because it, it had in the vaccine or the vaccine does have in it polyethylene glycol also known as peg and she felt she had an allergy to that from because she when she used her toothpaste it caused her to have some lip swelling and tingling. So anyways, um, I, since then, I, I've realized that there is some concern about allergy. And so I've, I've got together some allergists in San Diego and we're, we're ready to deal with uh, allergy reactions. And it just happened to be that after we got together, there were uh, eight cases at Petco just this last week of allergic type reactions that occurred to the vaccine. And they occurred in a very... Uh, a short time frame, so there was concern about allergy, and we we got involved, and we've ad we've advised that these were probably not true allergy reactions, and that they could go ahead and use this batch of vaccine. So that's how I got involved, and that's how um, I have an interest in this. But I also am pretty knowledgeable about the vaccine. I'm not an expert, but hopefully I can answer any questions you all have about this COVID vaccine that I hope all of you are going to get as we move forward. Yeah. And that, you know, the adverse events, like reading through the New England Journal of Medicine's questionnaire, it, it's weird because they say they think it's like one out of every 100, 100,000 folks may get an allergic reaction to this, uh, specifically that anaphylactic reaction, right? Right. Um, and, and the poly ethylene glycol it's it's like rare that you would get a allergic reaction from that but that's what some of the experts are thinking is causing the aes the yeah, adverse it, event it is mark and i i don't want to dwell too much on the allergic reactions because I, I don't want people to have a fear of it but it, yeah all vaccines have in the background all vaccines have some reactions that are considered severe and in general all vaccines that we have that we give to kids then we take for hepatitis or for shingles, it's about a one in a million chance that you're gonna have a, six, a systemic reaction, meaning like a total body reaction. Mm -hmm. And this one, the data is still too early because you know we haven't vaccinated that many, um, is about one in a hundred thousand, but it's still really doggone rare. 
Yeah. And that just means, like you said, the more people that get vaccinated, the more numbers that that one in 100,000 will go up most right. likely to. It's yeah. what yeah. would be considered usual. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, gosh, let's just get in, into the vaccines. Like, what what are these things? And, and really what we're trying to address is we're just trying to bring value to we have the people that are on the fence, you know, like, I, I don't know, I'm going to wait or I'm not sure if I need to get one when it's my turn. And we have the people that absolutely will not get these because they think that there's something in them that's, um, that's going to hurt them. So I'm just hoping to bring some kind of value to the, those three types of thoughts. Um, but what are these things and why is it, why are people so interested in the mRNA? What's so unique about yeah, the mRNA? It is unique. It is unique. Uh, but it's kind of a, a, a neat kind of unique. I mean, it's, I think it's going to be, uh, well, we're already seeing that the, the efficacy is so high compared to other vaccines that perhaps this type of vaccine is going to go on to be used for pretty much many, many other infectious diseases. But so what they, we've always uh, had as vaccines we usually just take the virus and kill it and, you know, mesh it up and uh, inactivate it and we give out the vaccine. That's the most common uh, vaccine. We also can take just some of the protein that comes from the, the virus and give it to people. Um, and we've had that for a long time. These people who, smart scientists, uh, were able to do a different kind of mechanism where they take all, all protein is made from messenger RNA. It's a, it's a, a, a replicate segment of our DNA that goes out into the outer part of the cell and there it produces the protein and then it's expressed on the surface of a cell or it's put into circulation. And that protein, uh, in the case of the virus, is very important protein for the virus to be active and to attach to human cells. That's mm -hmm. what we've been calling the spike protein. Those little, mm -hmm. you know, those little spiky things on the outside of the cell that we always see. Well, yes. these people learned that they could, instead of giving the protein or instead of giving the, the crushed up virus, the dead virus, that they could give the little segment of message that makes the protein and that we ourselves are making the protein within our own cells. Hmm. By really a cool. special population of cells called the macrophages. And so when they, they get the vaccine and the messenger RNA, they, and they eat it, they engulf it, and then that RNA is a little message that uh, is then um, transcribed is the word. It makes a protein, and that protein sits outside the macrophage, and the immune system goes, oh, wait, my God, a foreign protein. And they start making an immune response to that protein, that foreign protein, and there, therein lies the immunity that people get when they get the messenger RNA. It's only one type of vaccine. We have some other ones in the pipeline that are gonna be the old kind where it's kind of a inactivated virus. We also have some people get, creating a vaccine that's the protein itself, but it's, it, it's, not, it's not made by messenger RNA. The, this one is made by, by the little messenger RNA that's in the vaccine. Wow, that's really cool. The what is that? The ribonucleic acid. <laughs> that's right, the, the RNA. You got it. RNA. That's that's really cool. And what I think is is cool about this, and um, and and help me because I'm definitely just the mount the, the mountain biker guy trying to swim in these waters, trying to figure this out. But I think what's cool about it is that we they have been saying that the virus is mutating a little bit, right? So maybe there's another. I don't know. Is it strand that they're potentially worried about? But it's cool because this particular technology, this mRNA, can be tweaked fast enough to kind of keep up with maybe any mutations that the current vaccine won't be helpful with. But but right now, it seems like it's it's dealing with the, the virus just fine. Yes, so there is concern about that. And, and you're right, the technology is such that you can tweak this. It would be unfortunate though, because it does take a while to to crank up that new production of the new of the new vaccine. So we're hoping, strongly hoping, that we're not going to need to do that. And so far, there's no strong evidence that we need to change the vaccine that we're presently using. Yeah, that's that's really good. And I was trying to think, like, how does a virus mutate like that? Then I started thinking, I guess if it's replicating itself millions and millions and millions of times. There's just statistically that there's going to be slight errors in its replication, which then causes it to be a little different. Is that is that kind Correct. of how it occurs? You're absolutely right. 
So this is happening all the time. Now, most of those errors are such that they're detrimental to the virus. So they don't, mm -hmm. they don't get passed on. But every now and then, there's going to be a little change with maybe that makes the virus even a little better. And so it's going to persist. And so um, you're absolutely right. Uh, this is just happening all the time. And uh, there is a chance that there's going to be a drift, a variation. We see this with influenza every year, this kind of drift in what uh, the virus is going to look like. So this is not a big surprise. Yeah, kind of par for the course, yes. so to speak. It, and typically, it doesn't mean that it's going to morph into something more dangerous, right? Typically, it, it's, uh, is it typically a weaker variation? Yeah, it, it can be. And, um, but it's, it's something that's a variation that's quite weak is not going to make it. So generally, as it varies, it's like more likely to be something that's either a little more um, contagious, like we're thinking is, is occurring. Um, with this one, it's not any more dangerous than the person who's getting it in, in terms of severity, but it may be a little more contagious. But there is a chance that could actually be even more damaging to, to the person who gets it, and the severity could be greater. But so far, we've not seen that, and, and the variants have been around for a little while. So that's good news to, to be able to say right now that that doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah. Gosh, if this thing is creating variants, um, it's kind of nice that these vaccines are coming out because uh, we know that the vaccines seem to be working with the variant as well. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, you know, I'm looking at this New England Journal, so let's get into a couple questions and folks if you're tuning in feel free to ask questions whatever is on your mind uh dr welsh and, and i want to just try to bring whatever value we can in helping you understand the vaccine um and dr welsh is one of the leading folks here on uh, the vaccine committee there down in san diego for COVID 19. so okay question number one dr welsh we have is how long will the vaccines work and our boosters Actually, let me let me take that back. I'm going to scratch that. <laughs> let me go back to the other one. Okay. Once the vaccine is injected, um, how do we know about each vaccine's efficacy since there are two approved right now? Well, th the good news is that the, the, the two companies that created these, they're very similar. And there's only different minor differences in the, in the preparations of these vaccines. We know that, you know, there's a difference in how long you wait between the first and second dose, but, but for them, and we're not even sure why that ever came to be. I'm sure they could have, it was arbitrary that one company, uh, you know, picked three weeks, the other picked four weeks, but they're really similar vaccines. And the data that we're seeing in efficacy and safety are very similar. So I, I think you guys who, out there who have not been vaccinated should be very happy to get any of the two vaccines. There's really no big difference. You're not going to perceive a difference. So there's one gives you a little less injection volume, um, but no, they look very comparable. And so th that's good news because you know we've got sometimes uh, product available for one and not so much as the other. And um, there really has not been shown to be any difference between the two. And the mechanism of action, meaning that the way that they both work is I. Identically the same. I mean, they, they're both right. mRNAs, right? Yes, they're both mRNAs. Now, again, there, we're going to see some new ones coming out, and one is from AstraZeneca, and that I believe is a uh, is a uh, an, a, a, an adenovirus, which has been kind of you know uh, tweaked so that it's not very it, in itself. The virus is not very uh, dangerous, but it produces the spike protein, which is again what we want for immunity to be able to. Um, to be able to be immune to this disease. So there are different different vaccines in the pipeline and and um, they look pretty similar in efficacy, the ones in the pipeline, although it's hard to beat 95% efficacy with yeah. the ones we have now. So uh, stay yeah. tuned on that. Those studies have not finished yet on those other vaccines. So we don't quite yet know what their efficacy is in the, with the new ones in the pipeline. Yeah, that's true. But man, 95%, holy cow. That's um, that's very cool. So to give you perspective, folks out there, um, what is it? The FDA requires is it a fifty percent efficacy to approve a vaccine? Is that is that right? Yes, that's right, Mark. Yeah, five, five zero five zero. So, um, so we're we're used to a fifty percent efficacy, and this sucker is coming in at ninety five percent efficacy. So, 
um, within that 95% for the person who's trying to think like, what about the other 5%? How does this, <laughs> how does this thing work? I mean, nothing could be a hundred percent, but um, what does that 95% do? Is it, is it uh, keep you from getting the virus? Um, can you still shed the virus or does it just keep the severity of the infection down or, or does it do all the well, above? It looks, <clears throat> it looks like both. So in the two studies that were done, one for Moderna, the other uh, Pfizer, there were four, roughly, I'm just rounding off, 40,000 patients in each of those studies. And, um, and, and, and then, so they looked to see how many people got infected. The placebo group was in the neighborhood of about 200 people came down with the illness, whereas only about 15, and I'm rounding mm. off here, came down with the disease with the active, you know, the active arm. And they noted not only were they not getting the disease, but even those who got the disease, it was a milder uh, disease. So it looks good in that it's, it's not only preventing disease, but it appears to decrease severity as well. Wow, that's huge. Because one of the big things with this whole pandemic is the overburden into the hospitals, right? So um, that's good news that if the vaccine can keep the cases mild, yeah. if they're, yeah. that's, that's going to be great to free up for all the other things in life that <laughs> we need hospitals yeah. for, you yeah. know, heart yeah, attacks, yeah. other right. things. Um, so that's, that's really good. Is uh, just seeing if anybody has any questions. If anybody has any questions, feel free to type those into the comment section and we'd be happy to field those. Um, going on to the next question, Dr. Welsh is, how long will the vaccines work and are, are booster doses required? Well, <clears throat> one of the problems with the vaccine being released early under the emergency um, uh, uh, approval process they had is we don't know the answer to that. Be most vaccines are studied longer for this answering that kind of question. This one has not been, or these two have not been, um, but from the data we have so far, which is of course limited, we're only talking months, these studies, these clinical trials were just completed. It really looks good. It looks like immunity is persisting. It's waning a bit, which is to be expected, but we don't have a good marker of immunity with these vaccines because uh, you have to understand the immune system has two kinds of ways of responding to infection. One is with an antibody which is a floating around protein that you can measure easily in the, in the, uh, in the blood. And we, we, we do that. And you've heard about how people check their antibody levels, but the other is cellular. The cells go after this and pe become immune and they hang around. And that's one that we can't really measure that easily. So hmm. probably the most important one when it comes to viruses is the cellular one. That's the one that's not easy to really measure to be able to say, yeah, this stuff is lasting for a long period of time. Now the antibodies can be measured and those look good so far. As I said, there's only a mild waning of the levels of antibodies as people move out beyond the time of their vaccination. It looks like they're persisting with their antibodies. But again, we don't have uh, really any long-term data. We don't know what's going to happen next year, for example. We don't have that data, mm -hmm. but um, it looks good so far for at least uh, immunity extending uh, a number of months out. That's great. Yeah, that's really great. And what's like a typical vaccine? I mean, they're, I'm sure they're all different, but in a typical situation, not this one, obviously, but specific, but uh, how long do antibodies typically stick around after a, a vaccine? Um, the kind of the pediatric vaccines, which are um, uh, different than influenza. So we'll, we'll talk about influenza in a minute, but the pediatric vaccines you know that when we get vaccinated as a kid, we're vaccinated for life. So there, the antibody levels stay around for life. Now there are mm -hmm. some vaccines that don't, don't work that well uh, and don't work that way. The influenza is a good example and we don't know why. We know one reason that they don't work as well and, don't, and the reason we have to have them every year is they change on us. So mm -hmm. we gotta get ready for the new variant. But these other ones like the measles and the mumps and rubella and diphtheria, when you get your vaccination series done, they're lifelong. I mean, they're, they're immunity. So mm -hmm. we're hoping, you know, cross your fingers, that this is going to be the case with the COVID. Um, yeah. 
We don't know yet. That would be great. <laughs> that would be great. But so far, it looks like um, one of the signals says yes, and the other one we're not sure of in the cell, right? So we're right. Yes, we're we're still. And then the the other good thing is, I mean, once you've been vaccinated, at least the immune system isn't totally naive to it, right? It, it doesn't. It could it, if say the antibodies were gone, does does it? Would you be able to create antibodies quicker since you've yeah, been exposed so that, before? That's the cellular part. Yeah, the cells actually make the antibodies. So the antibodies are kind of a marker of the cell response. So even mm -hmm. though your antibodies may be kind of waning or even gone, the cells, the factory cells, which are the you know the, the immune cells, the T cells, and some of the others, they're um, they're they're ready to go. So I mean they've been primed already. And so yes, Mark, uh, the hope is that the the cellular immunity generated from the, these vaccines will turn out to be the most important. Wow, and you can rev up be... those antibodies right away. Yeah, a lot quicker. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, I don't know, some of the folks who get COVID, uh, it seems to be that their immune system, long after the virus is gone, they go into that cytokine storm. And uh, hopefully by, well, I don't know, I should ask, do you think the theory is if you have a vaccine that that would can, that would keep your immune system from completely taking you out <laughs> down the line if you get oh, COVID. Absolutely, yeah. No, it, it, if you can, um, it, there are two phases of this of this disease, as you've alluded to. I think one is the infection uh, taking place and causing its own problems and symptoms, and then for some reason, probably the most important reason people get so sick is the way in which their immune response re deals with the infection. And th in some people, it's very hyper immune response. And um, that's the cytokine storm. And, um, and yeah, if you can blunt the first part of this whole thing mm -hmm. with the vaccine, you're not going to have the cytokine storm and all the, um, the hypersensitivity reaction that occurs as, as part of the second phase. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yep. Um, next question up here from the New England Journal asks, do the vaccines prevent transmission of the virus to others? Um, this is a hard one to answer because we don't have enough data yet, but it appears <clears throat> that um, the worry has been with the, this vaccine is that you could be immune and not yourself have a problem, and you don't come down with any overt COVID infection, but you could still get a little infection, and you walk around, and you're a, you know you're a, a virus spreader, mm -hmm. and uh, and that would be uh, that would be not good. And there's no way to say for sure that's not happening. But some of the data out of the clinical trials, when they would swab people out of their nose after the first vaccine and before the second vaccine. They did not appear, and, and they could have been out there getting infected, let's say, and not feeling it. They did not have virus found in their nose, suggesting that um, they weren't what we call asymptomatic carriers of the virus. So this, this kind of um, information is helpful. And in general, most of the time with these vaccines, if you can prevent people from getting infected themselves, then you are not, you are likely not, that person is likely not to become a carrier of the virus. So mm -hmm. everything so far looks good in that regard. That's huge. Yeah. I know at the, what was it at the beginning of the outbreak, it's what they call the R naught. However, many times a person who's infected spreads it to others. Was it like one to eight or something like that? And they wanted to get those numbers down. Yeah. Obviously this uh, data so far sounds really good. It'd be a one yeah, of zero. <laughs> ratio. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That would be really good. And I think that's some of the things that people may um, be afraid of is if they get the vaccine, you know, like, hey, I'm fine, but am I still spreading it? So, so far, the data doesn't look like it. No, it doesn't. That's, not, that's wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, here's something that I'm sure a lot of people would have questions on. Uh, the question here is, how do we know about the vaccine's long-term safety and, you know, specifically obviously whatever long-term safety we have is is not long long yet but i think the other thing that people there's two things here what's the safety that we have so far and what happens to 
that ribonucleic, that mRNA, once it delivers its message, you know, once the macrophages chew it up, what happens to it? Is it still floating around? Is it, is it dis- get dis- discarded? Um, how do we, what do we tell folks about those things? Well, you got to be honest and you're going to, we're going to have to say, and I'm going to have to say it. We don't know what the long-term safety is. Um, and, uh, um, and, but, but we know what long-term safety is of all the other vaccines we've created so far. And they're, uh, although that's debated by the, you know, by the anti-vaccine group, there really does not appear to be any long-term side effects of all the vaccines that we created up to this point. And uh, granted, they're, they're different than this one, but still the whole idea of vaccination and all, all that has been one of long-term safety. Um, so we don't really know. Uh, I'm not sure, Mark, I don't think this little RNA molecule hangs around very long. Once it's um, processed by cells, uh, we have very good mechanisms of breaking it down. It does not enter the DNA. We know that from work in animals. Uh, this, this vaccine mechanism of messenger RNA has been studied for many years. This did, just, this did not appear during the time of COVID. This has been in the in the laboratory for a long period of time, ready to go into humans. And from animal work, there's no evidence that the, the important DNA we have um, inside the nucleus is affected by this. So we don't expect that to occur, but um, who knows? I mean, we, we don't know. It's just, we're taking a risk right now due to the uh, severity and seriousness of this pandemic that this vaccine's not gonna have the long-term risk that we fear. And um, it's a benefit risk ratio. And uh, like I said, I've gotten, I've been fully vaccinated. I made that decision that it's time to get the vaccine. Yeah, no, and and me too. So full disclosure, I had my first dose about five days ago and haven't had any side effects of any kind. Um, I feel fine. I feel like I, it was almost like a dream. Like, did I really get the vaccine? Did I really have, do I really have it? (laughs) Because I didn't. I didn't get any side effects, so but I hear that dose two might be a little different. But the one thing that I did get is I got a little smidgen of mental hope that uh, we're on our way with this thing, uh, this virus, this pandemic, and that felt great. That was definitely a gear shift in my mind. Obviously, still masking, still trying to keep social distance, and you know, do all those things the best that I can. But by by getting vaccine one. I definitely felt a, a bit of um, hope and smile that uh, we're on our way. Uh, one of those good side effects. That's a good side effect. Definitely. <laughs> a really good side effect. Um, let's see. The next question that comes up in here is, uh, and it kind of alluded to it already, but uh, how and when are the vaccines being made available? And well, we're uh, out. They're out on the East Coast cranking these uh, these vaccines, um, you know, to get out to, to the states. And um, it, it gets to the state, and, and I can't tell you how, how many they get and how they, you know, how they determine that. But the states then take it, and then it goes into the county level, and um, that's what you're seeing happening right now. There is an agreed-upon uh, phase system, of, of tier, a tier system of who's to get it first and who's to get it later. You, I'll pop sure that you on the screen. Huh? Yeah, I'll pop that. I'll pop that up on the screen yeah, there yeah. for you, Dr. Welch. So um, it's basically two phases, and phase one is going on right now. And um, phase one can be divided into A, B, and C, one A, one B, and one C. And within one A, which we are just completing now, and which is why I got my vaccine. It was basically all the healthcare workers uh, made up of made up one A. Anybody connected with patient care, whether it be you know the, the the janitor in the in the in the hospital or the cafeteria person or or physicians, they got they've gotten the vaccine, and I think we're pretty well along with completing one A. So then we're moving on to one B, and one B is what they call essential workers. Now, 1B has in itself two tiers, tier one and tier two. And um, it's basically um, the first first part of, of, of tier 
1B is anybody who's old. Now, there's been confusion about how old is old. Mm. Definitely, when you, one, um, 1B, anybody 75 and over is supposed to be, get in there and get their vaccine. But where it's kind of been changing down to 65. So that's kind of a little fluid right now. But 1B is um, mainly supposed to be the most essential workers be, uh, need to get this. And, um, um, and you see that listed, I think, in your in your um, uh, slide, in that thing that Mark is showing. Let me see if I can find that. So basically, yeah. it's like, the it's, it's the, let me see if I can pull that, get that bigger. And I got it right here. It says phase one, in order of priority, they have clinical and non-clinical healthcare workers doing direct and COVID facing care long-term care facilities, rest homes, and assisted living facilities, first responders, EMS, fire, and the police department, congregate care settings, including corrections and shelters, home-based healthcare workers, and healthcare workers doing non-COVID facing care. That's right. the phase one. <clears throat> and for the folks listening, if you guys want to get this, this is the New England Journal of Medicine, and it's a Q and A that they have up. And I put the link on my on my bio and in the Instagram link there, and uh, it'll take you right to this if you want to see the print. Yeah. So so as you said, we're moving into one B, and um, there are the two tiers of one of one B. And the old, the older people, seventy-five and above, and then basically, um, it's the people in the education area, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. child care, emergency services, and food and agriculture. And I can't define any, any, in any detail what those mean. I mean, education and child care is is pretty obvious. That's the teachers and the child care providers, and emergency services. I, I'm not quite sure what food and agriculture means, but it could mean the Vons people and the um, uh, selling the groceries and the people, uh, you know, interacting out at the front lines with people. Mm -hmm. And then tier two is still essential workers, but they're not as essential as in tier one within phase one B. And this would be the transportation. This would be your bus, the bus driver. Uh, this would be um, Commercial residential. I'm not sure what they mean by that. That could mean even in my building where I live in a condominium high-rise condominium building with a lot of people. It could be apartment buildings. It's not clear. I think hmm. we'll know this as we get further along. Um, and then congre in congregate settings with outbreak risks. And this this is the jails and um, um, the prisons and so forth are going to be in that tier two of 1B. So again, we're through 1A, we're moving into 1B, uh, tier one, we'll see tier two coming. Now here's where the next one's gonna be interesting. And Mark takes care of, uh, Mark is involved in, 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 in helping physicians take care of people with asthma. And, and I take care of patient, patients with asthma. So they're, they're gonna be moving into phase 1C. And uh, we're, we're gonna be treating people with, um, you know, we're going to be giving vaccine to people who have chronic medical conditions. Now, it turns out, actually, Mark, if you look at that, just for your own information, mm -hmm. um, that 1C will not include asthmatics. It'll include COPD. Mm -hmm. It'll include severe immune deficiency patients, like uh, patients on anti-rejection uh, medications and so forth. But asthma in itself is not going to be a reason to be in tier 1C. You're going to is wait that, till phase 2. Is that because the data so far shows um, that asthmatics may not be as at risk as they once thought? Correct. Correct. And specifically, was it more of the um, atopic asthmatics may may not be as at risk specifically. Well, those that ones. came up. Yeah, Mark's alluding to the fact that it looked like actually it was beneficial to be atopic, right? That's what I've heard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, I've not seen anything further on that. So that if Mark's saying if you were allergic, maybe you actually had a little protective effect there. And, um, but I think it's mainly, um, there's just no data that they're at risk any higher than the general population. So basically they're going to be in phase two. 
after all the phase one is done. And this is all listed to go from December. The phase one was December through February, and then phase two is listed for February through April. And already there's been some fluid changes to that, right? So like um, adults 65 and older, I think, are able to be vaccinated as of today. This is January 21st, mm -hmm. um, 2021. Yeah, so I think yeah. they are, they're ready to go. And educators, I believe, are also in that in that same phase, uh, yeah. the green light right yeah. now yeah it's great that's awesome the challenging thing is trying to find a spot that they could they can get injected it's just uh but everything is running through systems right now right so they have to go to the community-based vaccination yeah. locations um, yeah there's a, there's a reason for that let me tell you why people are, are saying well gee i just like to go to my private doctor and get the vaccine well there's a little bit of a problem with that one is the storage that's needed it has to be really cold. <clears throat> and most offices don't have the kind of freezers that are needed to, to store this. And the other is the amount of patients who get the vaccine. These vaccine bottles have um, 10 doses. I think one of them has 10. The other one has, well, maybe they both have 10, Moderna and Pfizer. I can't remember. But the point is, you got when you get that out of the refrigerator, you got to use all 10 doses. And if you have a clinic that for some reason you scheduled maybe 10 to come in, you know, to your little private clinic and you only have seven people show up, three doses are not going to be used. And so it's problematic. It's a, it's got a potential for wasting a vaccine by having this vaccine available to the small practitioner out there. So the, the super stations and the larger sites make more sense. Hmm, that makes sense. Yeah, they've got a way to really fully utilize it. And I mean, the refrigeration on this, on these two approved vaccines, is it, what is it like negative something well, crazy? Pfizer's right? minus 70. Pfizer's wow. minus 70. That's, that's amazingly cold. And then the wow. uh, Moderna is minus 20. So that'd be very difficult for your, you know, just normal practitioner to have that kind of operation system in, in their well, clinic they, but they won't and they don't have to but if, but if they if you take it out of that temperature you now have just a few days to then get it into the arm of a patient and the mm. logistics of that is just you know it's just hard to be able mm. to pull it off so i don't yeah. think we're going to see very soon this available you know by your uh your primary care doctor yeah yeah that's uh is it the lipids in the vaccine that, that need to stay that cold? Because that's what's carrying the RNA? Or is you know, it the actual I, I, yeah, it's a good question. I have never been explained why it needs to be so cold. Okay. Yeah, because it can it can get out of that temperature once you're ready to use it, but then you, you can't re refrigerate it, right? Right, it's, right. Um, okay, the next question is, are the recommendations the same for each of the available vaccines? Yeah, totally the same. No difference okay. at all. Same, well, same. except for the, the interval of time between first and second doses is different. But other than that, they're identical. Gotcha. And so Dr. Walsh was referring to, I think, is it the Pfizer that's 21 days uh, after your first dose, 21 days later, you take your second dose. And then uh, is it Moderna? Is it 28, yeah, 28 days? Yeah. Is that what it was? Yes. 28 days. Now, and just, then just so people know, though, this is important. Let's say you have an appointment and, and they'll try to make an appointment for you the day of your first dose, but you can't make it in for whatever reason. You should still go in and get your second dose, even though it may not be quite 28 days. It might be 33 days or 35. There's really actually no definite time where you are not eligible for getting the second dose. Oh, so that's a good point. Should, you should get in there and get it done. Now, they don't, want you in, they don't want you in there earlier than four days. So you can get in a little early if you want to, but not more than four days. Four days before your second due, right. due injection. Right. Okay. So, so yeah, so that's, that's really good. That's a really good point. So, and the other thing is if you miss that 28 days, if you're on the Moderna or you miss that 21 days for the second shot, if you're on the Pfizer, it doesn't mean you have to start all over, right? You just go in when you can get it as Correct. soon as you can. 
at that Correct. point. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure there wasn't any data saying start all over. <laughs> There's nothing no, there. No, no. It's good. So, so that's good. I mean, that brings some of the anxiety down on trying to get that second one. And, you know, I, you and I work in healthcare, obviously, different levels. You know, I'm, I'm more of, uh, I go in with you with uh, where the patients are. But um, for somebody like me going into get the vaccine, what was great is that uh, I did mine at Petco Park. And after I was done, I got an e-chart email and it asked me to go ahead and sign up for the second vaccine. So it wasn't like I had to try to find a whole new place all over again. Um, the system was pretty organized in the sense that as soon as I got the first vaccine, it already had me listed to get that second one uh, 28 days later, which but was great. Mark, did, did you have to go back to Petco or could you go anywhere? That's a great question. It, it was for Petco. Um, it was for Petco. But I didn't know if it gave me an opportunity to change locations. I, I think it does. I think I it think does. it does. Yeah. That's good. That's good. But, but let me give a plug right now for anybody getting the vaccine. You're going to hopefully be reminded about uh, an application called V-Safe. V is in mm. vaccine safe. And um, I really would encourage that you get that application um, once you get your vaccine or even before you go in. Better it would be actually before you get in. You download the app on your phone. It's a little confusing in the app store because there's a lot of V safes. So you might have to kind of make sure you're getting the right app. And uh, what it does is it, it tracks your having received the vaccine when you got it. It gives you reminders. It asks you if you had any side effects. It, 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 it makes sure that you get the second dose. And again, it monitors you after the second dose. And uh, it's wonderful. I think it's great. It's going to create a lot of inf useful information. And so I strongly encourage you to consider uh, using V Safe. V Safe, V is in Victor Safe. I think I was getting that text message actually, Doctor Welsh, after my after my vaccine, and it just like a quick little five question deal. How do you feel? Do you have anything that you want to report? Do you have any soreness? Yeah. Um, it was it was really easy. And and does that get collected? Does VSafe collect that over to the CDC? Is that who's behind that one? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, it's connected okay. with CDC. That's great. That's great. Just so they can keep an eye on anything that might be happening. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, next question here, Dr. Welsh. Are there any contraindications to any of the approved vaccines currently? The nice, easy answer is no. There's no reason a person cannot get this vaccine. There's no contra indication. That means reasons you can't get the vaccine. The only one you have is if you had the first one and had a bad reaction, now you have a contra indication for the second one. But mm. there is nobody so far that they've discovered is a, is has any kind of medical problem or condition that would uh, that keep that would keep them from getting this vaccine, and part of that is because of the mechanism. It's messenger RNA. There is no live virus. There's no attenuated virus. There's no really mm -hmm. actual virus <clears throat> going on here. It's just a mimicking of the protein made by the virus, and therefore it makes it quite safe. And there's no reason uh, there. There's no reason you can't get the vaccine. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah, and it, and it's not DNA. It's just. It's just RNA. Right. Um, can a patient with a history of an allergic reaction receive the vaccine? I think you just went ahead and, and uh, yeah, addressed but, that one. But there are, there are some concerns with people who have had a history of anaphylaxis, meaning a bad systemic reaction. The CDC has come out with some guidelines suggesting if you have had anaphylaxis to anything, whether it be food or, or injection or bee sting, the only difference that CDC uh, tells us to do with that, with you getting the vaccine is to watch you longer than the usual 15 minutes. Mm. So they just want you hanging around for 30 minutes instead of 15. And that's probably pretty smart because most acute allergic reactions are going to occur within 30 minutes of any serious nature. So that's the only thing mm. that's going on right now as far as you, a person having an allergy problem of any significance is you got to hang around for a little longer. Okay. That's not bad. Yeah. 
I mean, if they, and that probably makes the person feel better too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so instead of 15 minutes, like everybody else, it's just 30 minutes. And, uh, and, uh, after that you're free to go. Yep. Um, that's good. The, n- the next one is should immunocompromised patients receive the vaccine? What do you think about that one? They probably need it more than anybody else. So again, th- there, this is not a reason being immunocompromised is not a reason to not to is not a reason to not get the vaccine. And in fact, these this population of people of patients really need this vaccine. And in fact, they are up, up higher in the tier system for getting the vaccine. So um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's actually the right thing to do. If you have if some kind of uh, immune system deficiency, you really need to be getting your vaccine as early as you can. Yeah. And it says here, there's a list, but this is not a hundred percent inclusive, but some of the examples, if uh, you have cancer, uh, bone marrow transplant, solid organ transplant, stem cells for cancer treatment, genetic immune deficiencies, HIV, or the use of, this is pretty open, the use of oral or intravenous corticosteroids or other medicines called immunosuppressants that lower the body's ability to fight some infections. So those yeah, folks here. this is your chemotherapy, uh, which does knock down the immune system. That's how they work. And steroids, which is your cortisone or your um, pred- prednisone or IV, solumedrol, whatever. There is a little... Um, you know, there is immunosuppression that occurs with those. So these mm. people particularly should be getting the vaccine. So let me say, let me ask, we talked a little bit about the asthmatics earlier, uh, not being in that phase with uh, the COPD patients. But if you are a severe asthmatic that are on chronic oral corticosteroids, based on this, would you be a candidate to get a vaccine a little earlier? Absolutely. So okay. yeah. When I talked about asthma before, I was talking the run-of-the-mill kind of asthmatic, and many of them are on inhaled steroids, as you know. That the inhaled steroids would not put them into this category of you know higher up on the list. So, but certainly anybody bad enough to be on a regular program of oral steroids would be fitting this criteria. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So for the folks that are out there taking inhalers, um, your steroid impact footprint is in the micrograms as far as dosing goes compared to the oral corticosteroids, right, Dr. Welsh, where you're in the milligrams. And so, okay. So those folks, okay, here's, here's one for the mamas out there um, that are pregnant. And I remember reading something uh, when this pandemic started that the pregnant moms are at more risk of, of severe disease. I don't know if that's true, but the question says, should pregnant or breastfeeding women receive the vaccine? Well, you know, the, um, the, the, the bottom line is they weren't studied. So we don't know what happens when, the, when women pregnant or breastfeeding get the vaccine because they weren't allowed to be in the studies. Mm. Having said that, though, as you said, Mark, um, pregnancy does represent a risk factor. And therefore, um, th- that, would, that would be in favor of, of getting the vaccine. Uh, and there's no animal data so far because this has to be studied in animals uh, quite a bit before it's released into humans. There's no a- animal data that would suggest that this is this mRNA vaccine is harmful to the fetus. Mm, and, okay. uh, and similarly, no, no reason to think that this is going to be harmful to the baby who's being breastfed. Got it. So it wouldn't cross over to the baby. Okay. Yeah. So there you go, mama. So it's kind of like one of those, um, you're at a greater risk potentially, and it's just up to the individual mom to see if that's the right fit for, for her. Right. We call it, the, 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 the term that we're using a lot is shared decision-making. Okay. So you as a patient, along with whoever's advising you on the vaccine, have to share in that decision. Yeah, to see what's, what's best. Nothing wrong with, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Um, okay, are there minimum or maximum ages for patients to receive the vaccine? Well, they did study it only in um, adults uh, down to age 18 for the, for the uh, uh, Moderna and Pfizer, I believe is 16. And I always get these confused or reversed. But anyways, so there is a minimum um, right now. 
um, of 16 or 18. On the other end, there is certainly no, uh, there's no maximum age. In fact, the older you are, the more, the, the, the more you should get the vaccine. So, um, but there is a minimum and it's being studied in children right now um, to see, you know, how it works in children, but, but no, um, um, you know, for, for, for adults and young adults, it's been studied and it looks to be, there's no difference between the age groups as to whether it was more efficacious or um, more unsafe in the, in, in the younger or older population. Got it. And that was probably just by design, huh? Because they knew that the, the older you are, the worse potential chance you have of having a severe infection due to COVID. Um, it wasn't anything that they, it's not like they tried to put kids on and it didn't work. They just didn't study the, the kids. Correct. Correct. And they were, okay. as you know, um, they're, the kids are not doing as, as badly with this disease as the, the, the adults are. So I think they, they narrowed in on the, the, the more risky population. And do we know why that is yet? Or is that still an unknown? Still unknown. I, I <clears throat> you know, one theory is that they, um, they don't have in their, in their upper respiratory tract system, the type of, uh, 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 the, the, their cells don't have these binding viral binding uh, units on the surface of their cells. So the virus just can't attach to the epithelial cells and then take and then and then become infect, you know, infected within the individual. So that's one theory is the kids are just can't the virus can't grab onto them and cause an infection. So that's that's one theory I've heard. But I don't think we know yet what truly why kids are more protected with this. Well, I mean, it's it's a good thing because I've seen my kids eat things off the floor and everything else, and I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> this is going to be really rough. Yeah, <laughs> turn off being two weeks is almost a year now. <laughs> so thank goodness the kids don't get it as 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 bad that we know of right now. Right. Um, what about the what is the maybe the thought about the kids? Obviously, they they don't get it as bad. Maybe it's not attaching, like you said, to the epithelial, but. Is that also correlate to why maybe they are not as much of a transmitter, or is that? Yeah, is both. That, yeah. So if yeah. you can't get infected, then you can't be much of a transmitter. So. Oh well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Well, Good you, point. Can be, you can be an asymptomatic carrier and transmitter, but um, I don't think that's happening. So it's they're not even like it's not like it's like they're getting they're getting the infection but not getting ill, but they still have the potential to pass on the virus. We've been mm -hmm. worried about that for a long time which is why the schools are still closed. Um, but I don't think we have evidence of that to say that there are silent carriers of this virus at this point that I'm aware of. And I'm not an expert on this, but that, that I'm was, aware of. That was just, that was the worry. That's why they closed everything down for yeah. the schools. And some but, of that has to do with more just the teachers fearing of, um, you know, of the virus and not so much the kids are going to get sick, but the teachers tr protecting as much as possible, the teachers getting infected. But if the kids are not silent carriers of it, then maybe the teachers are, are safer than what we thought. Yeah, that's true. But I mean, it's good that the teachers were elevated into that uh, phase one yeah, right yeah. now. So, so they're we able to it. go in. If, yeah. If they want. It'd be nice to be able to get both parents back to work, you know, yeah. and uh, yeah. keep the teachers safe, obviously. Um, that would be very helpful for the economy, <laughs> for a lot of our sanities as well. Yeah, We're trying to juggle yeah. work and kids at home. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I, feel for, I feel for them, man. <laughs> um, for anybody who's going to get the vaccine, is there anything that you would need to watch for or report after administration of a vaccine? Well, just expect, you know, guys and gals, a sore arm. And, and, and it's a good sore arm because you're thinking, oh man, my immune system's working. Mm. So um, sore arms are really common, 70, 80% of people. Sometimes That's they're right. bigger you know, than others, but, um, and if you're having that as a sore arm, live with it or use your Tylenol or ibuprofen. And if you really want to, you can also put some steroid cream on the large local reaction. Mm. Um, yeah. Is that because, I mean, obviously that's the injection site, but that's where everything's being absorbed, right? The macrophages yeah, yeah. are. Your immune cells are really, you know, focused right in on that area. And then they leave the area 
and then you know continue your immunity away from the area. So it's it's good. Um, and then and then on the first dose, you generally do not have a lot of systemic symptoms. Like you had some, Mark. I didn't have any. The second one, though, get ready for that one more than the first. And you uh, you can have fever and chills. They usually occur more later after the shot. Uh, body aches, lethargy, maybe some headache. You can feel pretty lousy for about, you know, six, eight, ten hours. And then people report they're back to normal. They're great. Mm. And, and that's just your immune system getting a workout, right? Is that what right, that's attributed that's right. to? Yeah. 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 No, that's great. I mean, I I didn't feel anything after this first one, so I'm hoping that the second one's the same. <laughs> but to in me, to me personally, in my mind, that's a small price to pay. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I expected the worst. I was ready with my Tylenol, with my ibuprofen. I was ready for a lousy night, and I went to bed, and I woke up the next morning, and I like went, "Wow!" I mean, where was the reaction? I kind of got robbed. <laughs> I guess, but, you didn't no. have it, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that I mean, that is the questionnaire in a nutshell. Um, you know, as it goes out, there's 23 pages on this uh, New England Journal of Medicine uh, Q&A if you guys want to dive into it. Um, but that pretty much up to page 17, 18 is kind of the crux of it. Um, is there is there anything else around the vaccine that you wanted to share or anything that may help somebody who's on the fence decide to get a vaccine? Yeah, that's a tough one. I, you know, even in my own office, I've had some uh, some of our medical staff having some uh, vaccine reluctance, <clears throat> and it's um, understandable. I mean, totally understandable. But in life, you got to weigh again that benefit over the risk, and we do that all the time. We get in the freeway, we make a decision that the benefit of getting down the freeway is outweighs the risk of being in a bad auto accident. This is the same kind of thinking that is involved um, there, the, everything so far, I mean, I mean, th I think we're up to 10 million doses that have gotten into people worldwide and it looks pretty doggone safe. Uh, granted it's short term, but um, that's the best we have right now. And um, I hope that you, uh, if you're having reluctance that you seek out some information from other people who you trust to get reassurance and, um, um, and I hope, you know, I hope you make the decision in favor of getting the vaccine. Yeah, that's a good point. If, if you're, if you're nervous about it, there's a lot of information, but there's so much misinformation. How do you know if you're looking at actual scientific information versus, you know, somebody's thoughts that are unscientifically backed? How do you know? Yeah, I hear you. And you got to rely on certain sources and, um, the CDC, I got to tell you, as much as it's kind of got a little bit bashed in this early on in the uh, COVID pandemic, I'm impressed with how good it, it seems to be for reasonable information. It gives you the stuff that tells you what they don't know. They tell you how they came to the conclusion that they did come to. And I still feel the CDC, as it always has been, is a great reliable source and I would I would go to them first CDC CDC just cdc.org and uh, take a look at some of the things on the COVID-19 vaccines there um, as far as Moderna and and the lot number and, and things like that versus Pfizer I mean nothing really to worry about there your your guys's for the folks who are wondering what I'm talking about, I don't know if we said it before we started the show or not, but uh, the Petco Park had a lot number of the Moderna vaccine and it was paused because there were certain people who had an adverse reaction. And um, you guys went in and investigated it and found out that, um, oh, I'll let you take it from there. Dr. Well, yeah. Welsh. There were about eight, uh, seven or eight cases all in a very clustered time period of getting reactions. And when we studied it, they were mainly getting some lip swelling and facial swelling. And then they were reporting, but not objectively, we, they weren't able to, you know, to see it objectively that they had this or that symptom, you know, lightheadedness or uh, chest tightness. 
And none of that was ever objectively confirmed. So we think this was a unusual cluster for unknown reasons, not likely even a true allergy reaction, um, even though many of them got epinephrine, which didn't actually help, which is, makes it likely it wasn't an allergic reaction because epinephrine usually helps the allergic reaction. Mm, and, uh, since that time, and, and in other states, they've been moving along with the Moderna vaccine. They haven't seen it uh, happening in other locations. Uh, there were thousands of people at vac uh, Petco that day who didn't have the problem. So we don't know. This is kind of an example, though, of how something can make uh, a person reluctant to go get the vaccine. And, and again, a good example also, if you got to stop and look at what some experts um, said about what happened and rely on the on their conclusions. In this case, we felt that the batch should uh, continue to be used and it's being used today and knock on wood, we haven't heard anything yet. No, that's good. That's good. Because that, that unlocked about 300,000 more units of uh, the doses, that's right? Yeah. 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 So that's that's good. Because I know they're only allocated a certain amount, I think, right? Yeah, they're it's allocated. precious stuff. Yeah. 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 It's funny you said that because uh, you get these reports like that, but um, what is it? Is it penicillin? It's like there's an adverse reaction there, one out of every 5,000, and you'll never hear anything about it. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. But if you get one in a million on this thing, boy, it's going to make the news. It's going to make the news. You're right. Yeah. So it's just kind of the world that we're living in. Um, well, Dr. Welsh, thank you very much uh, on the information about the COVID-19 vaccines, the differentiation of them, the dosing. Um, hopefully we were able to, or hopefully Dr. Welsh was able to address some things that uh, maybe you were apprehensive about the vaccine or maybe didn't understand around the vaccine. Um, and Dr. Welsh, if people have questions after this goes on YouTube or goes into and goes into the podcast world, is there a place like a public forum place where they can ask or a good place they can ask questions and get more information? Well, they can give them to you, Mark, if you want to, and you can pass them on to me. The, yeah. C the CDC also has, and maybe I'll get that to you if you want me to, they have a, a place where you can post questions directly to the CDC, which is nice. Okay, and that's just uh, cdc.gov, and they can start there? Well, no, no, I'm going to try to get you so you don't have to, you know, manage and go through the whole CDC website. I'll get you the exact link. Okay. And I'll put that in the show notes for the folks there who are interested in, in knowing more. And then um, for, this is primarily a, a mountain bike show, mountain biker show. And I kind of went a little bit s off the trail in this one because I was getting a lot of folks that were mountain bikers that were asking when they heard that I got my vaccine um, that they weren't going to do it, or some people can't wait, or some people are on the fence. So I thought this would help out. And, um, you know, some of the questions, if you don't mind just a few more minutes, I have a couple more questions when it comes to social distancing on the trails and with your, with your expertise around, you know, immunology and allergy. Um, when we're out on the trails and it's, you know, we're outside and it's the, it's the daytime and, we're out riding. How how nervous do we need to be, if at all, by being around other mountain bikers that are not in our household? I mean, how obviously the bike we keep pretty far apart because it's almost built in social distance. Yeah, you have a built in six feet there. <laughs> yeah, but uh, is there anything that we need to worry about there? Well, I can't think of anything in, in, in anything unique to what you're doing. Uh, I go hiking, you know, I just came back from uh, the desert. I hike with a small group. We stay, you know, kind of far apart, but we're totally outdoors the entire time. And um, I feel totally safe and nobody's ever commented that it's not safe. I think you guys are doing the right thing. I mean, you're, you got, you're fortunate to have a sport that, <laughs> that has uh, the outdoor quality to it. And uh, I think, the problem is probably at the end when you, you used to share a beer together <laughs> and get and, and not distance back then. If that as long as you're not doing that at the end of your ride, I think mm -hmm. you guys are you guys are doing the right thing and, and the safe thing. So go for it. And and what is what why is outside so much more beneficial than 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 inside? I mean, I think I know, but I just needed to ask. Yeah, I and I, you know, I, I, I assume I know. And it's just the air circulation. Uh, when you have a, a burst of aerosol filled with virus coming into the air, um, 
it, there is a certain amount of dose needed that you have to come in contact with for the virus to do its start and become and and and, and create the infection and you're just dispersing that uh, dose so that it's low enough that it's not going to be able to grab you and get you infected it's it's somewhat dose dependent and um, that's the good news about this virus in the sense that the outdoors has continued to be a fairly safe location for people. That is so awesome. I love that. I love that. Yep. Is is there also something like with, with regards to the sunlight? Um, does that break down the, uh, I don't know. I've not heard that, Mark. No, I, uh, I've not heard that. I think. So uh, just outside day or night, just. I mean, you're right. There is, there are um, certain light waves that have been used to, uh, to, to, uh, to sterilize. I guess the word is uh, the COVID virus. But I don't know if there's enough in normal light, um, in the normal light spectrum, for that to be playing a role. I think it's all more, um, it's, it, it's, it's uh, the movement of the air that you're expelling is you're moving that around a lot more and dispersing it in, outside than indoors and indoors you not only have the immediate um exposure uh, of indoor stale air the, in some cases it's being then recycled again through the uh through the uh, the uh, the indoor circulation of air and, and it can then create just a room filled with a lot of virus that's mm -hmm. accumulated yeah so like you're saying that dose that you needed the viral load or dose could be higher indoors because you're accumulating that huh. correct Correct. In interesting. I, that makes co that makes complete sense. Um, well, this has been awesome, Doctor Welsh. I I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate the information and the time around this. Uh, for the folks out there listening, uh, present or in the future, um, I hope this was helpful. And again, like Doctor Welsh says, uh, if you have any questions, furthermore, you could either DM them directly to me, and I can get them over to Doctor Welsh. Or uh, there's a website that uh, Dr. Welsh is going to provide for me that I'll be able to put on the show notes here. And uh, you guys can do some some homework on that if you like. Uh, Dr. Welsh, is there anything else in closing that you'd like to add? No. I, I, other than Mark, you're fabulous, man. You really are doing a service that's uh, pretty, pretty um, awesome, I think. So I, I want to give you kudos for doing uh these kind of topics because it's uh it, it you know in all kinds of ways of communicating we got to get the word out and you're helping in this regard with with the vaccine that's so important for all of us to be able to pull out of this pandemic so thanks again for what you do oh man no problem at all i i actually when i got the vaccine i started vlogging about it on ig just to see and report anything that i may feel for people who haven't yet gone through the experience or maybe aren't sure if they want to in hopes that maybe it'll help them decide for themselves what they feel most comfortable with yeah. if they go with the good. vaccine. Good, um, good. But I got to tell you, man, no side effects other than I've been doing so good on the bike. Ah. I, <laughs> I've been doing really good at the house with the kids, with work. Hey. I, I, this may be a miracle. No, I, I can't go into that. But <laughs> it's, a, it's a white lie. Go ahead. You can do it. It's not a hard <laughs> one. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, with that being said, uh, thank you again, Dr. Welsh, for, for your time. And if for anybody out there who have allergies, um, asthma, uh, Dr. Welsh, can they still book uh, to can, can they still schedule an appointment to see you as an allergist or, or one of your colleagues at your location? Absolutely. Yeah. Allergy and asthma medical group uh, down in San Diego. Yeah. On Rough and Road. Rough and road. And are you still, so, and, and a lot of my audience is, is uh, kind of spread out. So I know you had the San Diego office. Do you still have the Escondido office? We do. Yes. Every Thursday. Every uh -huh. Thursday. So, and who are the, who are your colleagues that are there with you? Up in Escondido, it's Susan Lawback and uh, Bob Gang go to Escondido with me. But uh, okay. we also have our main office in Kearney Mesa and we have a number of providers there every day. Yeah. So if you guys are having any sniffles out on the trails, uh, Dr. Welsh is a world renowned allergist and we're lucky to have him here locally. Again, I hope this was helpful to you guys and any questions at all, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'll put Dr. Welsh's contact information in the show notes as well. If you need to book anything uh, to see him or one of his colleagues. 
All right, guys. Well, thanks again, Dr. Welsh. And uh, we'll, we will see you guys on the next episode. Appreciate you guys for being here. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye, Mark. Take care. Get you guys. Hey, thanks, Dr. Welsh.